Hi, uh, in this section in the video I'm going to be talking about the models used in this project. Uh, so by that I mean like the neural net models uh, used in that first step in uh, this process here. Uh, that is uh, taking that uh, image as the input and then outputting this vector field uh, prediction and the semantic segmentation. Uh, so this was a part in the project that took a while for me uh, to get right. Uh, this um, structure was more complex than like other ones that I've used before uh, and I I found this diagram kind of unclear at the start, uh, so yeah, she had to do some further reading to figure out like what these blocks actually meant, uh, like a con v and rel u meaning convolutional batch normalization rectified linear block. Uh, that can sort of that sort of makes sense. Max pool makes sense, but something like a residual block uh, is uh, not a complete description of uh, what this actually does. So anyway, some some further reading was was required. Uh, uh, also, in this part of the video, I'm going to be looking at um, the results of the different models uh, that I used. Uh, I have a, of, um, a function uh, in my code which like, uh, plots the performance history of uh, each of the models as they're trained along each epoch. And uh, yeah, uh, so anyway, so the best performing model that I got is uh, for the for the vector field prediction uh, is the PV net model, or in mine, uh, changed it to Steve net. Uh, so basically, uh, this diagram, once you understand it, uh, it, it actually explains what it, what it is fairly well. Uh, it's made up of a couple elements here. So these blocks here can be thought of like as uh, sequential layers, but each of these blocks is, is uh, or most of these blocks are more than just one layer. Um, also important is uh, this these skip connections here. Um, so those are uh, those just uh, those kind of do what they sound like. Uh, they pass the output of a certain block and don't pass it through you know this middle part here. They just pass it directly to the end, and then you can add uh, those inputs together uh, at that point. Um, so let's take a look at what I got for that. Uh, so I have um, this is where the PVNet structure is implemented. Uh, so at, let's take a look at that. Um, We have our first layer here, that's the comp 2D batch normalization activation, uh, the max pool layer, and then we get to our residual block. So the re residual block, as they go on to explain in this paper, actually comes from uh, this ResNet uh, model, which is uh, described, I guess, in this paper. Um, and what we have here is uh, there's several different models of ResNet. Uh, they, they base, uh, the PVNet guys base their model off the ResNet 18, which is described here. So the main thing in the ResNet structure is uh, this This is the residual block uh, that PVNet is referring to uh, when they have that residual block. So what the residual block is, is we have our input here, we have our convolutional layer, a rectified linear, like another convolutional layer, and then so the output, and then we have this like kind of mini skip connection that just goes around those. So each of the convolutional blocks uh, has this. Um, there's a lot of speculation, I think, in the machine learning community as to like why this actually works. Uh, a couple thoughts that I have on it is, first off, you're not changing your first input. So whatever the machine has learned up until this point doesn't kind of get recombobulated by these weight layers. You know, it still is there at the end, and then you can add it and hopefully get something useful from these layers is uh, one thing. Also, these big skip connections, I think, help with the vanishing gradient problem, which is when like stuff... Uh, um, layers are like buried too deep in your model, so they're not basically uh, the back pop back propagation process doesn't have a uh, large influence on the weights uh, of uh, those layers, and they wind up not changing a lot. And the model takes very very long to train, and so you have the kind of front end of the model learning a lot faster than the back end of the model. But obviously, your back end is so the model takes a really long time to mature, and the sides are kind of out of sync. So instead of uh, by using these by using these connections, you you are reducing the distance of these back layers to uh, to the kind of back propagation process, or you know the loss value that's being used to drive the back propagation process. Anyway, uh, now that we know what a residual block is, uh, what else is in this diagram that we need to understand? There's a strided uh, convolutional block, so that is basically just the same as a rigid residual block, but one of them uses a strided convolution, which is how uh, they reduce the dimensionality. Uh, in the middle, they use a dilated convolution, so I think that the original ResNet uh, uses another strided convolution, and this would 
the, these two sections here uh, would be, again, uh, reduced in their dimensionality by half. Uh, what they did here instead, I forget what the reasoning was for saying why they didn't want to do it, but they do, they use a dilated convolution, so what a dilated convolution does is instead of looking at pixels that are directly adjacent to each other, it dilates them. So if you imagine looking at a 3x3 three three block, instead of looking at, you know, a 3x3 th a three three block of the pixels that are uh, in that square, you expand the square so it's it's one pixel and then one pixel that you're not looking at, another pixel, and just doing that throughout. Uh, so you get the slightly larger square. So that has the effect of preserving information, but uh, you still, the process is this like looking at a 3x3 three three block with a dilated convolution on a layer that is twice the size uh, is, is the same as, as looking at um, a 3x3 three three block without dilation on a layer that is half of the previous layer size, hopefully that makes sense. Um, in the rest of the in the rest of uh, this model, so we just have these more convolutional batch normalization uh, rectified linear blocks and then upsampling. Uh, the upsampling has the effect of bringing this output back to the dimensions that we need it uh, for our final output. So that is SteveNet, uh, or sorry, that's PVNet. Um, this is SteveNet, just an implementation of it. Uh, I guess I can't, I won't bore you guys by doing all of it, but you can see these re these residual connections are denoted by this kind of res1, res2 stuff. Uh, I have here an example of a residual box. So uh, we have the skip connection, uh, the convolutional layers, which are being handled by this function here. Uh, so there's convolutional layer, batch normalization, and an activation, and then uh, and then we have, then we're at, so we'll, we take our input and we add it to our skip connection. And then this is another skip connection made to repeat the process. Uh, so that's what's going on there. Okay, so first I want to talk about um, how these graphs were generated. So the data was saved uh, training, so, so uh, TensorFlow, when you're doing this model fit, or I guess it's TensorFlow Keras, when you're doing this model fit, you can kind of save all these attributes. Uh, so I have this history variable, this history list, uh, which I'm appending to after each uh, epoch, and then you can uh, I'm pickling that at the end. Uh, so I create this like history log dictionary entry, and I have the history. I'm doing the same thing for the validation history, and you can get similar values, uh, which uh, include the loss. Uh, so that's I'm so and then in my uh, load or whatever I'm calling this plot histories, uh, we're loading uh, these uh, pickled dictionary values and uh, just reading those uh, lists of loss, and that's, what's, uh, that's what the plots actually are. So, uh, looking at these, uh, let's look at the vector models first. Um, so, I have quite a few models here. Uh, this graph is very crowded, a little bit hard to read. Um, but, here is the final product. Uh, so we can see here, uh, we have a training loss on top and validation loss here on the bottom. Uh, the validation loss, as usual, is um, the one that we're really interested in. I use data splits uh, when doing this training. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the validation loss is uh, you split a set of data, uh, a set of, in this case, images not to be used during the training. And you can ensure that uh, your model will be working well on newer data or data that it hasn't seen before. So this way you can ensure that your that uh, your model has actually like generalized uh, um, you know, whatever it is that it's trying to do, uh, it's, it's found a good method uh, that's applicable to, da to data that it's never seen before. Uh, one of the big problems in uh, machine learning is overfitting when your model will perform uh, quite well on training data and then have a significant uh, um, performance you know, loss on uh, your validation data. Um, and we can see that a little bit here. Uh, so basically, these uh, these models are grouped into two categories uh, generally. Uh, three, if you want to include you, uh, the UNet one, uh, I made a UNet uh, that outputs um, the vector coordinates. Uh, it's not very good, um, so we can just pretty much ignore that. Uh, we can see that they all look pretty similar in for their training loss. Uh, but what's happening here is uh, the augmentation ones are this group up here. The augmentation uh, was not successful or like was not beneficial, at least uh, the style of augmentation that I implemented. Um, so, but, uh, and then this group down here with the much uh, lower loss uh, is uh, the ones that, so the, the ones that didn't use augmentation. Uh, there are models down here that were trained using the alt labels. There are models down here that weren't trained using the alt labels. Uh, 
So at least at like this point, uh, there was really no performance difference uh, between those two types of models. Uh, but we'll see later on uh, when we actually test uh, the final performance uh, whether the alt labels uh, work better or whether they or whether the difference is negligible. Um, but that'll be interesting to see. Uh, so that is it for the. Uh, vector models. Let's just actually look at a few that were successful. Uh, you can see that the the new SteveNet model uh, was one of the high performers. A uh, green one is the old SteveNet model that didn't use augmentation. Uh, this brown one here was one of the ones that did use augmentation, so it's up here. Uh, the blue one also uses augmentation. That's up here. So it was. It's pretty clear from these graphs that augmentation uh, was was or my augmentation uh, was not good for these models. Um, looking at the oops, looking at the class outputs, uh, so I have those models in this uh, in this line here. Uh, so there's just three of those. We have uh, the new Steve Net, the old Steve Net, and then the UNet. Uh, so let's take a look at what that looks like. So training loss, uh, somewhat similar, I guess. This one was pretty volatile, so it's kind of interesting to see if uh, that one would have gotten a little better. Uh, towards as the project matured, I, I was uh, spending more time, like, uh, giving longer training sessions for the models at the start. I didn't want to spend that much time training on models that I probably wasn't going to be using in the final iteration. Uh, but we can see here that UNet actually seems to be consistently the best performer, both in terms of the uh, like the best values that we see, and also this like this volatility uh, in validation data that seems to be a problem with uh, the SteveNet models. Even though it seems to be a little calmer towards the end, and you know maybe with more and more time it would have been okay. But uh, UNet like learns quicker and has less of those uh, those kind of spikes. Um, so I think it makes sense to use UNet. Then again, we can we can also one of the nice things about this project is that you can mix and match uh, classes with each other pretty easily. So take a look at that kind of sort of thing. Um, yeah. So that is that. Uh, next part in the video, we're going to be looking at uh, the actual uh, prediction results. So of the pipeline and uh, see how those met get some metrics on like what is the best uh, model performance and how close they actually get to the true predictions. So stay tuned for that.